So as we've already said, today we officially kick off our capital campaign, and our theme today is gratitude, and I'd like to uh, start with a video. We asked uh, some of our young people what they were grateful for, so let's take a look at that. I am grateful for all of my friends and family who have supported me. I'm grateful for my family. I'm thankful for anyone who ever supported me in my life. I'm grateful for my parents and for you too. I'm grateful for my family, my friends, sports, food, water. I'm grateful for my family. I'm thankful that I have a roof over my head. I'm thankful for my family. Okay. I'm grateful for blah blah blah. <laughs> I'm grateful for family. I'm thankful for Jesus and God. Um, I'm, grateful I'm grateful for my sister. <laughs> I am thankful for everyone who's just spoken. So. Our theme today obviously is gratitude, and uh, I need to begin by saying, first of all, how grateful I am to everybody who has been working uh, very, very hard on this campaign over the past couple of months. Uh, our goal is to raise a million dollars, and you cannot do that without a significant amount of support and without a team uh, to help you with that. So to this wonderful uh, campaign team, I just want to say thank you, first of all. And I also want to say thank you to everybody who has uh, prayed and dreamed and hoped and uh, worked to bring the project to where it is right at this moment. Uh, everyone who worked uh, on the design of the Family Life Center, everyone who shepherded it through layers and layers of approval, uh, everybody who raised money in the past, everybody who gave money in the past. Um, so much was done long before Kathleen and I ever got here uh, to get us to this point. The groundwork was laid. And there are far too many people to name in all of those uh, layers of commitment. But uh, you know who you are, and I'm grateful uh, for each one of you. So for all the sweat and for all the toil and for all the tears, and yes, there have been tears, um, I'm grateful. I'm grateful to see us making progress. And I'm thankful to our expansion team and to our trustees and to our project manager who's uh, managing this job right now and for your patience in dealing with the inconvenience of having this major construction happening here as we're trying to do all the things that we're doing. So thank you. That's a good place to start for a sermon on gratitude, right? So let's take a minute and we'll pray together. God, we do thank you. We thank you for your great love for us and for the way that you work in each of our lives. And we pray that in these moments that you might be at work in our hearts, that we might hear and understand a word that you have given uh, for us, for our hearing, for our help, for our understanding. Lord, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So I've said it before, I'm sure, but I really believe that gratitude is the foundation of all uh, real and healthy faith and spirituality. So there was a mystic, a great mystic uh, from Germany in the 13th century, and his name was Meister Eckhart. And what he said was, if the only prayer that you ever pray in your whole life is thank you, it will be enough. And I truly believe that. It's that important. It's important because whether we have uh, gratitude present or absent in our heart determines whether our hearts are open or closed in large part. Gratitude is like this uh, two-way hinge, you might think of it, like those uh, hinges on those doors that go in and out of a kitchen, right? That enable us both to receive that which God has for us and also then to share it with others. And we can talk about all the ways in which God blesses us every day. There are many. But if you'll notice, when we talk about joys here in the church, and I ask people and encourage people to share their joys, they fall into just a handful of categories, right? Recovery, so health, uh, family, right? Friends faith. The list of things that trouble us is endless. It has an infinite number of permutations. But the things that we're grateful for all come down to some really basic things. So we can talk about the blessings of God's creation. We can talk about 
the joys that come from our relationships with other people. We can talk about all the simple things that really make life worth living. We can talk about a nap, right? A good meal, right? Spending time with people that we love. These are the blessings that most of us would look at and say, these are the things that we appreciate about life. But without gratitude, the question is, do we even ever notice them? Have you ever known someone with kind of a complaining spirit where it's just like there's nothing that can ever go right for them? So you might, out of your own kindness, take them to the best restaurant that you know, right? You sit down and you're having a nice dinner. But there's one problem, right? They really should have taken the butter out of the refrigerator long before this. <laughs> Because how is anybody supposed to put butter on this roll, right? When it's this hard, you know? So your reply to your aunt might be, well, you can always put it in your armpit for a little while. <laughs> um, so if you don't live in gratitude, one of the things that happens is not only are you missing out on all the blessings that God is giving you in that moment, but if you think about whoever that is that you pictured in your mind, they're also putting distance between you and them in that relationship. Because it's really hard to stay connected to somebody who's in that, that frame of mind, right? So if you don't live in gratitude, your heart's never open to all that good that surrounds you. And instead, the only thing that you're really open to is everything that confirms your experience of the world as being negative all your fears, all your complaints, all your criticisms that are directed at you, all, all, all your hurts. And so I said gratitude is like a two-way hinge because when we can receive and fully receive the good things, then also we can use the things that we've been given to bless others. When we realize that, we recognize that we don't have to hoard these things for ourselves. And whether we're talking about forgiveness, whether we're talking about love, whether we're talking about material goods that we've been given, when gratitude lives in us, then the doors of our hearts are able to swing wide open. And we're free to release some of those blessings that have been given to us back out into the world to bless others. And that's important as we think and we talk and we pray about the future of the church over these next few weeks. We've obviously set a lofty goal. We talk about a million dollars. That's a large amount of money, no question. We're talking about undertaking a project that's the most significant thing that we've done since this church has moved here, okay? So uh, we started here in about 1973 at this location. And I always think about those who made that journey, some of whom are here in this room right now, who made that journey to come from in town out to this location to build a new church. And I think about that, that sacrifice that it took. What we're aiming to do next, after we complete the site work that we're doing right now, is to raise the building itself. And our goal is to fit out the main assembly area, so the large space that's on the second floor of the building, and then to rough in the classrooms and the kitchen. Okay, so those areas we don't expect to get done right away. And initially, the new space is going to be connected to this building with a covered walkway that will come right out uh, from the back door of the church here and go right across. And the new building will sit right about there. Okay. So yes, there is much more work uh, behind this, even once we complete this next phase. But we'll get there. We'll get there by tackling it in stages. We're taking this step. We're undertaking this project because we want to be open. We want our hearts to be open. We want our church to be open, to be able to have space to do uh, the things that we would like to do, to welcome new people into worship, to be able to uh, welcome people into fellowship around the table in the way that we can't do right now because we just don't have the space to do it. We want to be able to welcome new young people into our youth groups, to be able to invite the community to take part in uh, mission opportunities that we host here at the church. Uh, we want to be able to uh, educate our young people and our adults alike in the faith and help them to understand how God is at work in their lives. 
So a million dollars is a lot of money. And there's no question that there's no one gift that's going to get us there. But all of us, working together with God's help, can bless this church and bless the community through the work of this church with whatever gift each one of us has been given. So we practice gratitude because we recognize, first and foremost, that God is the ultimate giver. That God is the one who started all of this. In the words of the epistle of James that we read earlier, every good and perfect gift is from above. And it's often been pointed out that the most famous summary of the gospel that we find in John chapter 3, verse 16, right? For God so loved the world that he gave. When we look at the verb in that sentence, it is giving. It's God sharing something with us. I know that it's easy to be like that aunt who, you know, complains about the butter. Because we can always look at ways in which our lives have fallen short, maybe, of our expectations. And I was struck in reading this passage again at the way that James brings together the idea of God's blessing and endurance and trials. So he puts together these two ideas this way. He says, whenever you face trials, consider it nothing but joy. Let endurance have its full effect so that you may be mature and complete and lacking in nothing. The word mature jumped out at me. That the mark of mature faith is being able to be grateful regardless of the circumstances. And I know that that's not easy. But it's the recollection that God has acted first and that God intends to act again. That's what's important for us. I had a friend in the first church that I served, and she came um, at exactly the right time. She showed up at a time that I I felt like uh, I was really kind of struggling, struggling to connect with people and struggling to make progress in that first appointment. And I was blessed because she exemplified this kind of faith that I'm talking about. It was very open, open both to receive the blessings that she'd been given, but also then to be able to let those blessings flow through her to other people. Mostly I saw that in her attitude and the way that she approached the world. Her husband, uh, maybe two years into that appointment there, maybe three, uh, after a long battle with lymphoma, had died. He was a wonderful man, and she could have easily have, have really kind of withdrawn into herself after that they had a great life together. But she didn't. Instead, she kind of turned her focus back to her family, specifically to her siblings and to her kids, and really decided that she was going to enjoy every moment that she had left. And so she focused on her family, and she focused on her faith, and she continued to have all kinds of adventures. And a few years later, then, she developed pulmonary fibrosis. And Even though she would drag along her oxygen bottle wherever she went, she still kept that same spirit. And when I knew other people who were dealing with this kind of diagnosis, eventually she had a lung transplant, I would have them call her, right? I'd say, you know, I know somebody who's been through this, and and she would love to talk with you. And uh, even though I wasn't her pastor anymore at some point, I still kind of kept tabs on her, kept tabs on how she was doing. And through everything, I noticed just that she never lost her faith. That when I would call her to give her encouragement, she would actually end up encouraging me. And she was amazingly generous, just with her time. And one of the things that, uh, one of the things that people said at her funeral, because eventually it did come to pass that the disease just couldn't be halted. And one of the things that people talked about was just her willingness to share of herself constantly. And um, I didn't know it, but she was supporting like a whole group of people who all had the same diagnosis that she had had. And she was in constant contact with a whole group of people. So that generosity of spirit 
really made an impression on me. And I found angels like her in every congregation that I served. And there are some here. People, who, people whose lives illustrate the gospel in some amazing ways. People whose maturity and faith uh, far exceeds my own, to be honest. Because while I can understand some things intellectually, including how to count challenges as joys, there are people that I know who live this every day. And that's what gratitude does for us. It installs these two-way hinges on our hearts that allows us both to receive God's blessings and then also to share those blessings with others. You know, gratitude is the ground on which we stand. And perhaps even in a more fundamental way than we can talk about love being the ground on which we stand. Because it strikes me that gratitude and our openness to receive what God has to give is kind of the starting point of faith. You know, at Thanksgiving, Carolyn Hone at the 11 o'clock service gave a talk on gratitude. And one of the things that she was speaking about was the science that's being done right now to describe and quantify and illustrate the effect that gratitude has on people. And obviously, our main argument for gratitude in our lives as Christians begins with a theological argument, belief about who God is and the fact that God acts first. God is a creator, and so God has to act first because God made us and not the other way around. So to us, that's where it begins, that every good and perfect gift comes from above. And so we direct our thanksgiving to the one who made us. But it's good in this instance to know that science also can bear out what we know to be a spiritual truth that gratitude can improve our outlook, that it can strengthen our relationships with people, that it can even improve our health by helping us, for example, to sleep better. That's one of the, the quantitative things that people have found. And it's good to know sometimes that science is on the same page as faith. And best of all, perhaps, gratitude is something that we can practice. So that even if you don't feel particularly grateful at any given moment, you can put yourself into that mode where you are open to receive God's blessings by taking a proactive step. In other words, you can kind of fake it until you make it, in this sense. So that's the reason why um, we've given you these little cards. And um, so if you have one of these, I'll just encourage you to take a look at it right now. Um, you don't have to put your name on it unless you want to. But in just a minute, we'll give you a chance to complete one of these. And then uh, we're going to hang them. We've hung some of them, ones that our young people have done uh, in the narthex already. And we'll continue to decorate the church with them as a way of demonstrating all the blessings that God has given us and being mindful of all the blessings that God has given us. My challenge to you is, as you go through this week, you might consider doing something like this every day. Some people write these things in a journal, but you can write them on whatever you'd like. But just to sit down every day and start with a prayer of thanksgiving. Remember that if that's the only prayer that we ever pray, thank you, that that will be enough. So let's take a minute and let's pray right now. God, we are grateful. We're grateful for the great gift that you've given us in Jesus. We're grateful for the gift that you've given us in each other. We're grateful for the way that people in this room have walked with us uh, through a lot of difficult things. We're grateful for the history of this place. We're grateful for the faith that has enabled us to do ministry here, and enabled this congregation to do ministry over a long period, going back to the 1820s. But we're grateful for your power at work. We're grateful for even the hard things in our lives that you use to open our spirits to your leading. But we know that you walk with us through every trial. And for those who face those trials today, Lord, we ask your blessing. And we ask that we might be sensitive to minister to them. Lord, help us through our thanksgivings to become more grateful people be at work in our lives.
we ask this in Jesus' name.